Like many South Africans, I grew up in a city, and for most of my childhood and my teenage years, I viewed the world through a distinctly urban paradigm. I lived in Johannesburg, and I seldom visited national parks or game reserves, so everything I knew about wildlife I learned from David Attenborough, and everything I knew about conservation was that people who did it had to wear khaki and epaulets. <laughs> Unlike Kuki Gorman, I didn't dream of Africa. Instead, and I'm a bit embarrassed to say, I dreamed of being the first South African actress to win an Oscar. Clearly, Charlize Theron beat me to it. And it wasn't until after high school, during one of the many gap years that I took, that the thoughts of conservation first began to seep into my mindset. I was 21 and working as a tour guide on overland trucks, carting large groups of foreign tourists through the wilderness of southern and east Africa. We visited, visited places like the Serengeti and the Masai Mara, in the Okavango Delta and Etosha National Park. And it was during this experience that I completely and utterly fell in love with Africa, with its sounds and its smells, its vastness, its wildness, its people, and in particular, its wildlife. And it was because of this deep emotional connection that I felt to the continent that I decided to abandon any dreams that I still had of becoming a professional actress and instead chose to directly pursue a career in conserving Africa's wildlife and wilderness. At the ripe old age, what I considered then, of 23, I enrolled to study zoology at the University of Cape Town. And in the decade that I've been studying and working at UCT, I've learned many things about why conservation is important. I've learned that our economies and our lifestyles depend on biodiversity, that our very survival depends not only on the products that biodiversity provides us with, things like food and water and energy, but on the services that biodiversity provides us with. And I've also learned that any efforts to conserve biodiversity are only likely to be successful if they have the involvement and endorsement of local and global communities. And that's why I'm incredibly proud to be working on a wildlife conservation project that is strongly committed to involving the people of Africa in our conservation efforts. The project that I work on is called Mammal Map, which is the short name for the African Mammal Atlas Project. The aim of Mammal Map is to update the distribution records for all of Africa's mammals. You see, if, if we're going to be effective at managing and conserving wildlife, then at the most basic level, we have to know where they are, and we have to know why they are where they are. But the reality is that across Africa, our knowledge of the whereabouts of many mammals is either outdated based on outdated historical information, or it's based on unverified anecdotes. And filling this crucial gap in our knowledge is the main aim of Mammal Map. Mammal Map is jointly run by the universities of Cape Town and Pretoria, but despite being embedded in these two academic institutions, involvement in Mammal Map isn't restricted to scientists or conservationists. This is a project that anyone, anywhere, can get involved in. Now, at this point, you might be wondering two things. The first is, if this kind of information is so important to conservation, why has no one tried to update it already? And the second is, if involving communities is so, is so important to conservation, why has this not been typical of conservation practice in the past? And the answers to those questions are actually one and the same. The technology to do so just wasn't there yet. And I'd like to introduce you to a single piece of technology that is currently changing the way we do conservation around the world. And that is the camera trap. Now, a camera trap is like a regular digital camera in every way except one. Where a regular camera needs a hand to push a button in order to take a photograph, a camera trap is automatically triggered to take a photograph whenever something, anything, moves past its lens. So how a camera trap works is you take it outdoors somewhere where you want to photograph wildlife, you secure it to something sturdy like a tree just to keep it upright, you want to position it somewhere that animals are likely to visit, like next to a watering hole or along a path, and you might want to conceal it a bit, just to make it a bit less conspicuous. Once you put your camera trap up, you switch it on and you walk away. You leave it there, you go home, and you hope that while you're gone, your camera takes photographs of the more cryptic, elusive, nocturnal, or shy species that are just, they just won't show their faces when people are around. Of course, you won't know what you've caught until you go back to your camera trap, retrieve the memory card from inside it, and download the images. 
Now, camera traps are new inventions. They were first developed in the 1890s by a photographic pioneer named George Shiras. George's cameras were made up of a tripwire and a magnesium flash gun. And basically, an animal would bump the tripwire, which would set off this flash gun, which was so bright that it would temporarily blind both George and the animals, <laughs> and so loud that it would send the animals fleeing for their lives. It's a century later, and technology has obviously come an incredibly long way. There have been massive improvements, not just to photographic quality, but to camera reliability and battery power. Camera traps are also smaller, they're more affordable, and they're more accessible. And as a result, they are currently revolutionizing wildlife research and conservation around the world. For example, cameras have already helped us to discover brand new species. This is the gray-faced sengi. It's a species of elephant shrew that wasn't known to science until one was caught on camera in Tanzania in 2008, making it the first species of elephant shrew to be discovered in 120 years. Camera traps have also helped us to rediscover species believed to be extinct in certain areas. This is an Amur leopard, believed to be extinct in China, until one was photographed walking by a camera trap in China in 2010. There are believed to be fewer than 50 of these animals left in the world, most of them in Russia, and camera traps are helping to understand where the remaining individuals are and what can be done to help them survive. An example from closer to home is this one. These are photographs of pygmy hippos taken in Liberia in 2011, proving that this population has survived two civil wars and massive habitat degradation. Now, there's very little known about these animals. They're very difficult to study, and camera traps for the first time are making it possible to offer insight into their ecology and their conservation requirements. Camera traps are also responsible for some enlightening discoveries. A 2,800 square kilometer camera trap survey of the central Sahara is helping to monitor these critically endangered Saharan cheetahs. Like the pygmy hippos, there's very little known about these animals, and camera traps are helping to figure out how many there are, where there are, and what can be done to help them survive. Now, a wonderful thing about camera traps is they remove the human element out of photography, which means that we get insight into how animals behave when we aren't around. And I'll demonstrate that by showing you a lovely video of an otter in Betty's Bay getting used to a camera trap that it finds in its path. <laughs> so it freaks out initially, which is quite normal. Eventually it comes back. has a good look around to see if it's a threat or not, and when it's not, it just acts like otters act. They love to roll in the sand, as it turns out. <laughs> and it's a lovely example of how animals can really just get used to having a camera trap there. It's a very non-intrusive way of observing their behavior. And this is a, a fascinating and award-winning sequence of photographs that illustrates a really nice interaction between two different animal species. So this is a David and Goliath type of interaction between a lion and a jackal in Namibia. In this scene, the Goliath is the lion, and David is the brave, if not somewhat suicidal, jackal. <laughs> You'll see why I say that. The jury is still out as to what exactly that jackal was smoking. <laughs> now, because camera traps are indiscriminate and they take photographs of anything that moves in front of them, regardless of size or form, you can sometimes end up with photographs of things that you just don't expect to see, like this potential poacher captured on camera in a national park in Laos. For the same reason, you can sometimes land up with photographs of things that you just don't want to see. <laughs> Naked hiking is a seemingly popular pastime in many parts of the world, and camera traps could make it even more interesting than it already is. <laughs> but let's return to Mammal Map. So 
The aim of Mammal Map is over the next five years to use the photographs recorded by camera traps, smartphones and digital cameras to update the distribution records for all of Africa's mammals. The big ones, the small ones, the ones that fly and the ones that swim. And we're doing this in several ways. The first is through data collection. So we're initiating a series of data collection exercises across the continent with an initial focus in southern Africa. And during these exercises, we don't only collect information about which mammals occur where, but we use them as, ex as exercises to test new techniques and technologies for gathering information. The second way we're getting information into Mammal Map is with collaboration. So there are plenty of people across Africa using camera traps and other methods to determine where Africa's land and marine mammals occur today. And by collaborating with these people, we're aiming to consolidate all of this information into a single centralized database. All of the information that comes into Mammal Map is processed in the same way. It first goes into a database that we call the Virtual Mammal Museum. Once it's there, a, a team of experts identifies each mammal in each photograph down to species level. And then the database software automatically uses the GPS positions that accompany each image to delineate the current geographic range of each species. Ultimately, we'll compare these current ranges with ranges from the past and ranges determined in the future in an exercise that has multiple conservation benefits. First, this comparison allows us to identify how animals are responding to things like climate-induced and human-induced habitat changes and to make appropriate decisions with these responses in mind. It also allows us to update the conservation status of each animal to make sure that all animals are assigned adequate protection. And finally, the information allows us to identify the areas of the continent that require the most urgent conservation attention and thereby directs how to spend scarce conservation resources. Now, I mentioned that this is a project that anyone, anywhere, can get involved in. And the final way that we're gathering information for Mammal Map is through citizen science. Citizen scientists are member of the, members of the public who are interested in devoting their time and their energy to science and conservation projects. Whether people have camera traps, digital cameras, or smartphones, whether they're in cities, on farms, in national parks, or out at sea, any of the photographs that they take of Africa's wild mammals can be included in the Mammal Map database. Citizen science is wonderful for two reasons. The first is that it provides a mechanism for scientists and conservationists to gather infinitely more information than they'd be able to do without the help of the public. And the second is that by becoming citizen scientists, people reconnect with the environment that they're in. They learn more about it, and many of them even go on to become ambassadors for biodiversity in their own communities. There's a wonderful quote by Alan Edison that reads as follows. Modern technology owes ecology an apology. This statement really resonates strongly with my ideas of environmental issues in Africa. But at the same time, I believe that because technology is becoming so ubiquitous across the continent, it doesn't just pose a burden on Africa's environment, but it actually presents us with an extraordinary conservation asset. When I think of the quintessential conservation icon, the person that comes to mind automatically is Jane Goodall. Her very name is synonymous with wildlife conservation and biodiversity protection. But I believe that if we can encourage people across Africa to take conservation into their own hands, to use the technology available to them, to get involved in an important conservation project like Mammal Map, then I believe we can empower Africans everywhere to become the Jane Goodalls of the future. Thank you. Thank you.